Julie, we've got quite a tricky setup in a way here with the film, haven't we? The Oranges. Um, it's a 50 something man who falls for a 20 something woman. And it's not just any 20 something woman, it's actually the daughter of his best friend. So, what kind of challenges did that bring with it when you were making the movie, and how did you go about dealing with them? Um, yeah, tricky, tricky premise, or like sort of potentially, you know dark or maybe even sleazy story uh, many many would think but the it, for me all the answers came from the script it was it was um, you know it was meant to sort of defy your expectations by you know not doing the expected in terms of it being about a grubby affair you know behind closed doors or about a man who's trying to sort of reassert himself in midlife in all those typical male fashions it was it was it was a bit gentler than that and it was a bit more humane than that and it was a you know the the story sought to sort of understand what people were going through rather than um you know go to the sort of nastier places uh i think to make the thing and make the film uh, you know if that's the central premise and that's the way of handling the story the the hardest thing was to make sure that you had a believable couple at the center of it and it wasn't you know it wasn't just to be like a sexual thing like well she's really hot and he fancies her and of course you get it and you know the story's probably easier to understand as a middle-aged man because Leighton Meese was so attractive but it was to make f you know sure that the feeling of sort of authentic uh, emotional respect between them was there um, and you know, the film is meant to carry the audience in a way that in spite of yourself, you might, you know, like suspend your judgment on on, uh, on the idea of the relationship and go with it a little bit. And of course, the cast is a phenomenal cast, but it's also so important, this ensemble cast that you have for really believing in those characters. And you say, going along with the story of this um, young woman and an older man. And, and also, these are families that have known each other for donkey's years, and it comes across like that. Now, tell me what it was that you saw in Dr. House himself, Hugh Laurie, for the central role of this. Um, I, you know, I promise you, I, I didn't bend from only ever... Uh, wanting Hugh to play this part because it's quite a hard role, you know, to have that 50-year-old uh, bloke and, you know, with an extremely beautiful girl and to think, you know, that it wasn't in some sense predatory and that was absolutely crucial to the way that the story works and, and that was what Hugh had for me. Hugh's, Hugh's a decent human being and he's a sensitive soul and you tend to like him. You don't you don't believe that his motives are necessarily cynical. So I'd always held out for Hugh. Um, and then I was just trying to cast someone that I thought could have good good, good chemistry with him. Um, uh, and, you know, the rest of the cast, frankly, was relatively easy because the script was good and, and talent by and large liked it and agents liked it, which means that you can get to talent and you were able to roll out all our favourites. But Hugh Laurie was the, the key piece of casting for me. What was it like working with him on set? We know him for so many things, don't we? And one of the things we know him for now is his jazz music as well. Was did he on between takes? Was he uh, playing the piano for everyone, entertaining them with his jazz music? He's a miserable old fu no. He's <laughs> he's a great man. I, I I really liked his lack of vanity. You know, he's a huge star in America, and we asked him to do this film for no money, um, and to be you know in an ensemble where he doesn't get the biggest comedic moments it's not the showiest part but it's ab absolutely the moral center and for him to see that you know and 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 take that that part on without trying to be flashy with it i thought lovely he's a uh, he you know he we know hugh laurie he's very very clever he's very articulate he doesn't suffer fools um but he was a team player you know we had all the cast in a house next door instead of trailers and hugh played piano all day long when we weren't shooting you know he loves his music i think it's where he escapes to but he also contributed a lot to the energy of the rest of the cast, you know, making everyone have a good time. He's a very funny bloke, actually, as is Oliver Platt. And and that house was, you know, probably funnier than the movie. It, you know, it was uh, it, they, they were they were, you know, bonding and making sure that the the energy was there to make the relationships in in the film play. And that's that, you know, that made my job a lot easier. As much as a, a romance, it's a sort of bromance, isn't it, in a way, between Oliver Platt and oh. Hugh Laurie? I mean, what were they like together off set? Uh, Offset, they were magnificent. They're both like extremely literate, extremely intelligent, extremely sort of wide thinking in their interests. And that was a power. So the funny thing about Oliver Platt is he loves gadgets in real life. I mean, he had no problem singing to that part of the character. He's a gadget man, and he, the uh, iPad was relatively new on the market when we were, and he was the first to discover it, I swear it. Um, but him and Hugh had a great intellectual sort of bonding. Um, uh, and 
and a nice kind of American Brit sort of interaction. It was a really charming, and I watched the two of them together offset a lot. And then when we started scenes with them, the two of them together, I was like, wow, these two really. They, it feels like a friendship that really counts. And and I bent the movie a little bit towards it. You know, I end up saying I think the real authentic love story of the movie and the timeless love story of the movie is the one between these two middle-aged men. And I always thought that was a kind of rather, you know, kind of nice way to go. Um, and the beginning and the end of the movie are somehow meant to reflect that. Mm. And later Meester as well. I mean, it's quite a different role for her, isn't it? Because, of course, we know her so well for Gossip Girl. What was it that made her stand out for you for this part? Uh, I knew Leighton a little bit. I filmed her in the first season of Entourage when she was, like, maybe 18, 19. So I knew she was very talented. And I also knew she was not intimidated by anyone she she's really a sort of sort of unlikely sort of star she takes nothing you know everything is just like happening to her she doesn't have any regard for herself but she makes her sort of mature beyond her years so I thought that would be a good thing in terms of believing that Hugh would fall in love with her and then I like the idea because I know Leighton's kind of nice and and quite natural that it'd be good to represent her from the way we've seen her in Gossip Girl she often plays the sort of rather dressed up sireny you know almost bitchy mm -hmm. character and this needed to be the opposite although she's playing a troublemaker uh, in the bigger picture of the story she you have to kind of like her as you as you kind of have to like everyone in the movie it's that kind of movie and then finally we finish off with Catherine Keener who's got a great part in it as well with well, all great parts and Alison Janney too and we've got our young star of Arrested Development as well were you a big fan of that when it was out? Uh, do you know I wasn't I met Alia because somebody the casting director on this film Jeannie McCarthy so the first name she she said to me when, about Vanessa was you have to meet Alia Shawkat which uh, you know I think that was the first I pursued Hugh and I had Hugh in the bag and then the f I had a cup of coffee with, with Alia and she's a very, very sort of offbeat presence. She's a very much a sort of singular personality. She's very, like, not wacky, but but unique, you know, and there's a lot, I met an awful lot of young actresses in this part. A lot of people wanted to do it and there's a whole sort of, you know, um, there's a whole uh, kind of rollout of sort of young starlets, but she, she you know, she, she was just herself in a, in a, in an offbeat manner, and um, and I wanted someone that would feel more like an underdog in the story. So I had Leighton, who was playing a more obvious beauty, and that had this kind of, you know, what we used to call the privilege of beauty. Her character, her life had been easy for her because because she was an attractive person that people were, were going to sort of fawn over. And Alia was the opposite. She was meant to be someone who was very, very clever, which Alia is, um, and a little eccentric for the world. So that sort of made sense. And I, I liked her role as, as narrator because it gave a sort of unusual perspective, you know, on the story, the outsider almost telling, telling the tale, outsider, insider, really. But and talking about outsiders, I guess you had uh, that kind of outsider perspective in a way, both being a Brit, but also having worked in documentaries. I guess you're used to kind of standing on the outside looking in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you bring bring documentary sort of tradition to anything you do once you've done it. You know, you just watch what's in front of you and you react to it. And, you know, and, and I think as a Brit, you come in and you like, you sort of, want it to be real somehow. I think that's in our makeup, uh, our sensibility. And, you know, I thought the film was a little more European in its sensibility anyway than American Funny because it's very much about the grey matter. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, heroes and villains and good guys, bad guys or winners and losers. It's very much about the messiness of life. And I guess that appealed to me. You know, I feel very European. I don't feel remotely American even though I've lived there a few years. But uh, um, I don't know what you bring. You know, I think you bring... How you, you do it how you see it and I thought it was that funny mixture of comedy and pathos that you know that's home territory for me and what can we look forward to next from you Julian well hopefully uh, this film called Half of the Human Race which is a, a novel an English novel it's a love story set at the beginning of um, of, of World War One, and uh, and you know, I'm working hard on a script uh, to try and get that one done. Uh, and I would love to do that. It's completely different. I don't think there's one joke in it. Fun funnily, <laughs> uh, maybe there should be. Uh, but it's very emo You know, it's very richly felt. And for me, cinema is emotion. I I I just want to go and be moved by characters and what characters are doing, if they're hysterical or funny or angry or whatever. You know, it's it's cinema is emotion for me. That's what I always that's what I'm always drawn to. But just before we let you go, I have to ask you, of course, because you worked for so long on, on Entourage, um, what do you think about the idea that now that it's going to be coming back for a movie, what kind of thing would you like to see having worked on it for so long? I haven't read, I, haven't, I, I worked on tons at the beginning, the first mm -hmm. half of the, you know, I did the first three seasons like full on. I haven't read the script. Doug 
Ellen, who created and wrote every episode or rewrote every episode, you know, has finished the script. Uh, the only people that have read it are, um, are the HBO uh, paymasters, uh, and nobody knows yet what they think of it. It just went in. Uh, and I think it'll happen. There seems to me a lot of goodwill for it to happen. People want to see those those boys together again. I, you know, there was a one point that the, the, the story might wholly be based in London. There was an idea that Vince might be doing a British movie, you know, a la Hugh Grant or something, but I don't think that's the end. I can't swear to you, but last I heard there was a change of plan, but so nobody actually knows what the story's going to be. But I thought Entourage could take a movie because you could do a self-contained story based around a film and, and you know, uh, you know, wrench all the, 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 the comedy and somehow deal with them growing up, you know. So I hope it gets made. Yeah. And how to make it in America as well. Do you hope that it gets picked up elsewhere now that, um, that it, unfortunately it didn't get taken up for a third season? I love that show. I, I, I think that show suffered from being always thought of as an East Coast entourage where mm. actually it was very different. You know, entourage has that whole west coast kind of aspirational glamour beautiful women locations cars and toys and and i loved how to make it because i always thought it was very grassroots it was about it doesn't matter if you get rich it's about living a good lifestyle with your friends and if you can create a working environment where you can do that and make a living by being with your mates and that's to be celebrated and we always used to talk about how to make it as a sort of for the obama uh, generation, you know, we the day we finished shooting the pilot was the day that Obama got elected, and we always just say this could be a rightful thing for us. And mm -hmm. the values of it were very different, but because it was like, you know, boys show, and it was the same people that had made Entourage, I think we got a little, a little pigeonhole there as a sort of East Coast mm -hmm. Entourage. I was, I was very sad. It was a nice, it was a lovely lineup mm -hmm. of, and you know, who doesn't want to work with Louis Guzman every day Absolutely. of the week? I mean. Definitely. Well, I hope it gets picked up elsewhere anyway for another season after this. So yeah. fingers crossed for that, and yeah. lots of luck for the next film, and of course with the oranges too, thanks. Thank you very much. I, I really hope people go see the oranges. Yes, so there's definitely. a few laughs in there.